You've tuned in to Arm and a Leg and other opinions we like to give. A weekly podcast hosted by two veterans dedicated to politics, current events, interviews, and anything else they want to mention, but probably shouldn't. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Robbie the Dream Gop and Brett Miracle Man Park. Hey, hello, hello. Happy Saturday, Sunday, Monday. What is it? Saturday. Thank you for Sunday. tuning in. Sunday. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to another arm and a leg, another opinion like to give podcast. I am Brett Parks. And this is your boy, Robbie Gop. Yes, I am all out of sorts today. I did not get to go to church this morning. I've been hanging out with my three kids uh, all day. So I'm about to rip not only their heads off, but mine as well. I, I hope I rip mine off first to get their heads ripped off. But any hoozy. Robbie. Hey man, how you doing? I, I I mean, I see that you're kind of flustered for your week, but <laughs> other than that, how's your week been? Man, it's been rough. I've been busy, but I haven't been like, uh, I haven't been going anywhere. You know what I mean? I, I've just been here. I've been working out. I've been, uh, I've had a lot of doctor's appointments this, this week. And those are always a treat because it's, most of them are in the VA and you know how that is. It's one of those hurry up and wait for three hours only to someone say, Hey, sure. uh, you're not in the right spot. You need to go, uh. You need to go over to this apartment. You're like, what? I've been here for three hours. It's true. It's true. How are you, man? Pretty good. I actually um, had a bunch of VA appointments this week. I got a new um, arm brace that's going to, you know, it's kind of, it is what it is. But and then I'm getting a new uh, machine that's actually supposed to help blood flow. So actually, yeah. they're actually helping me at this VA and it's pretty good. And I actually like where the movement's going for them. So. Is the uh, blood flow for just strictly the arm or is it like... It can be for anything. It's just mainly that's what my focus is. The okay. buffalo to my arm. So. Really cool. Really cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> VA could be, uh, could be your best friend or your worst enemy, depending. I always tell people from the very beginning, if you keep every appointment that, you, that, that, is, that is made for you, because you don't really make the appointments, they make it for you. If you can keep every one of them, the VA is great. But yeah, if, there's true. One, if there's one time that you're like, oh, I can't make this appointment. I need to postpone. Can we reschedule? That's, that's when it's all over with. So oh, yeah, then you, then you start getting pushed back six months for appointments and all those kind of things. Whenever, you know, you are getting them every, you know, every month yeah. or every bi-monthly. So socialized medicine. Got to love it. Right. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so man, I heard on your birthday, you, you got, had a little adventure. Yeah, it was. Tell me about that. It's pretty big. Um, actually, we were we were leaving our neighborhood. Me and Sadie, we were actually going to go. I forgot what we were going to go do, but I think we were actually going to take our kids to go get um, ices, like from a snow cone place. Mm -hmm. So we were actually going to go out. And what happened is, as we were leaving our area, I see this car come flying around the corner, and it's like a curve. So I'm like, okay, well, luckily we didn't go because we probably just got blasted, you know. And luckily we watched, but. As the person comes through, we get behind them. Then all of a sudden, they almost fly into the ditch. I'm thinking, oh, they're probably just texting, no big deal. Mm -hmm. But then there was a, you know, there's a stoplight. So as the people are trying to, like, as the people in front of them are already stopped, this guy does not stop. Like, he just kind of starts skidding, and he ends up going into the next lane. But it's like, okay, I'm like, oh, okay, Sadie, go ahead and try to, you know, we're going to follow this guy. I'm going to get his license plate or whatever. Right, right. And then as he runs the red light, because he goes around everybody, I'm like, okay. So I kind of just follow through. And then, um, he ends up swerving and almost hitting that person, two or three people actually flying over the median, like into the, the middle, almost hit the guardrail a few times. And then he actually went onto the highway. So I was more worried because now you're going to the highway, going into incoming traffic. And then luckily, luckily it all ended with no, no, in, no real big injuries um, to myself or anybody else. And we called the police. He ended up running into a phone pole going about, I'd say 45 to 50 miles an hour. So wow How he tried to fight me he tried to fight oh, me he was okay yeah. after he ran into the pole yeah, he was okay i mean he's he was completely uh obliterated i don't know if it was drugs or alcohol whichever but he was so out of it he was trying to piece together back his car and leave he was actually <laughs> had the car on and was still trying to leave so i was trying to i tried to take the keys out but then he tried to fight me so it what? was like oh boy oh yeah. that's that's messed up <laughs> that is messed up for sure <laughs> messed up <laughs> But overall, I mean, I was actually kind of happy that, you know, nobody was injured and I did my service, my community service for that day. And it was actually on my birthday. So yeah. So you checked it off the list and checked it off the list. Got some icy. <laughs> <laughs> we actually wow. tried the, um, the fruit loop 
or no, Captain Crunch actually made an icy at Seven Eleven. It was actually pretty oh, good. Is it? it? Berries, berries, fruit, berries. Sorry. Oh, uh, Crunch Captain Berries. Crunch. Yeah, Crunch Berries for Seven Eleven icy. It's pretty good. You know, I had. Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, PDQ in Texas. No. no, you're not in Texas anymore. You're in uh, Maryland. Maryland, but I, we don't think yeah. we have. We have PDQ here. It's it's kind of a newer thing down south here. And they have all kinds of cool milkshakes. They had a Captain Crunchberry milkshake. Mm. And yeah, you would think, you would think that it was like, hmm, yummy. But it was kind of like, uh, all right, I'm, I'm drinking the milk at the end of the cereal without there actually. Was a, the cereal. There was a, the best milkshake I've ever had actually came from um, Burger King. And they had a Fruity Pebbles milkshake. And it was the, it the was most good. amazing, yes, milkshake I've ever had. What's your, what's your favorite, what's your, since I love food, what's your favorite milkshake? If you had to pull one out, like, okay, you're about to die today, you get your last milkshake. What's that milkshake? Well, if people know me, I like to mix crazy things. But if I had, if I had to pick one thing that I could have in every milkshake to make it amazing, anything with mint. I just love the mint? flavor of mint. Yes, I love it. I don't know no, why. That's not even not, a dessert anymore. That's like a like, mouthwash. Not peppermint or nothing like that, but mint chocolate chip or mint really? Oreo, mint. I may have everything with mint. I love cool. strong mint. What is yours, Brett? Mine is, all right, I want a chocolate malted, ma- chocolate malted milkshake with vanilla ice cream. I love malted, kind of like the Whoppers. Whopper, yeah. not, not Burger King Whoppers, but the candy Whoppers. Just, oh, it's so good. It's my favorite. I think the we have a place here called Rita's, and actually my favorite icy I've ever had was Swedish Fish. Uh, oh, if nobody's ever tried it. Swedish Fish ices are the most amazing thing ever. That's weird yeah. because like the Swedish Fish candy is kind of like, eh. yeah, mm. I love it. I can chew on them all day though. They always get stuck in between my they, teeth, and then I'm there, I'm picking it out of my <laughs> teeth, and then I feel like this kind of white trash. <laughs> that's true. Freaking it is true. Yeah. So we have some pretty big topics today, huh, Brett? Yeah, pretty big topics. I don't know, man. It's everything's so discouraging these days. I, I'm just so like, oh, I'm just so upset. But um, but I, I'm letting it get to me. And there's a lot of lot of little petty things that are going on. But yeah, that we'll we'll, we'll concentrate on. I say I say the same thing. Um, I think it is frustrating. I think social media has almost pushed me away um, yeah. completely. Where if it weren't for my friends, still, I probably I'm probably gonna go through and only keep a certain people and you know not even because we talk about whatever it is it's just i almost would rather keep family and friends that i actually don't have to talk about what's going on in the world with any longer on social media because it's like every day it's either an up or a down and more down than ups well a great example is i'm not going to say his last name because i don't want to call him out but chance um yes. he you know every single day Every single day, he posts something political, something bad about Trump, something bad about, for some reason, something like, like that's a thumb in the eye to the soldiers or whatever. And, and it's like, now I'm just trolling him. I'm just trolling him now because he's so obsessed. He's such a social justice warrior and so obsessed with Trump. And he hates him so much and all this stuff. And, and I'm like, I even said to him the other day, he's like, why do you always troll my, my, my feed? I was like, dude, all you post is political things. You are obsessed with it. And he's like, well, I never post on your things. I said, go into my Facebook wall and look at my history and see how many political things I actually post. Now, I comment on a lot of other people's things, but I rarely ever post a political, a political opinion. And if I do, it's up for about 12 hours and I take it down just so a select people could, could see it and comment on it and I get a vibe of what people are thinking, then I take it off. But, but it's an obsession with so many people. They're so obsessed with, with um, being outraged or, or hating a president for no real legitimate reason other than he talked nasty one day about a, a woman, and which, which wasn't good. But, but come on. It was 20 years ago. Get I over mean, it. Let's look at what Bill Clinton did in office. I mean, that's yeah. by far superior over... But- Listen, Trump's yes, speech. Bill Clinton did that, but let's let's let's. But we don't bash facts. him for it every single day. Well, let's face the facts. If you are the most powerful man in the free world, I'd say there's more, most likely probability that that you are messing around in some way. And a lot of people are saying how much of a saint Obama was and all this stuff. I don't buy it for a second. Don't buy that just because he's been he was protected for eight years. I don't know. Now I'm not saying he was going around chasing tail everywhere. But, but uh, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. And these guys have the ultimate power. 
And, and I knew, actually, I still know I'm very close with a woman that, that is in the political theater. And she says that political theater is the most sexually charged place she's ever been around. And this is a girl from Miami. He's go clubbing and everything. And she yeah. thinks the political theater is more sexually charged than the clubs in Miami. So, so the, none of these guys, are their hands aren't clean. They're all dirty in one way or the other. So I don't want to hear it. You know, that, that I think people are so mad at Trump because he doesn't sugarcoat anything. And he, there's two sides of Trump. There's the rhetoric side, the side that he says, and then there's the side that's actually his policies. And his rhetoric sucks. You know, it's, one, it's entertaining but it doesn't win him any points, but his policy side, he's winning, you know, he's being successful and, and people aren't seeing that side. They just see what they read on Twitter and what CNN and MSNBC, what they say. And, and they just parrots things. And I hate it. It's true. Like I don't feel Trump is always politically correct when speaking or even, even just his, his Twitter account and that kind of stuff. He isn't always correct in my eyes. I think there's a lot of times when I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe he even said that or this or that. But you know, that's the thing. He's a real person where people, a lot of presidents have been fake and have promises and made all these things that they don't follow through. Recently, I watched um, I was re- watching on the news that, you know, Trump made the call, was making, had a phone call with um, Mexico and actually made a lot of things happen with the, with the border security and all the kinds of stuff like that. But then with that, C, you know, CNN and a lot of other news medias, they said, oh, well, they had a, they had a, a debated it. Um, I guess, uninteresting conversation. And it's like, that is not what happened at all. All, You know, all these other news medias were like, that's not what happened at all. You know, he actually Mm -hmm. made moves that actually are benefiting both, you know, America and Mexico in both, in both ways. So I think a lot of times now the agenda is being pushed that whether we like it or not, it is almost a dividing agenda for somebody and everybody wants to make that happen. So, yeah, of course, of course it's, it's just it, you know, it, you hit you hit the nail on the head. So what we got today? So I think mm-hmm. we're, the first thing we're going to talk about is the Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka, um, the U.S. Open. So yeah, congratulations, Naomi. Congratulations! That's, that's amazing. Th- didn't even she didn't even win a set. That that is a way you go down as a champion, I think. And if you could if you could go out any other way, coming from what I think she was the twenty fifth or 22nd in the world at the time and beating, you know, one of the top athletes in the world ever. Yeah. I I think she is. I think Serena Williams is quite arguably the greatest female athlete of all time. I mean, I'm okay. If somebody came up to me and said that to me, I'd be like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that completely. So huge. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. What I, what I was very, I was kind of upset about was, while she's on the podium and, you know, everything is supposed to be for her to watch her have to apologize for winning as she's crying and these things, because yes, she looked up to Serena Williams as a mentor and then to beat her, I'm sure she was ecstatic and even overwhelmed by that. Oh yeah. But then to hear booing and everything else is, you know, for somebody that young. They were booing her? They booed. Yes, they were booing. Why? Because she they felt well. They felt that Serena Williams, you know, made the almost made the show about her because of the there was a bunch, there was some stuff that the referee called out that possibly yeah. Serena Williams was cheating. Tell tell me tell me exactly what happened with that. Let's give context to this. Well, there was a there was a few things, um, but there was uh, one time when the during the play, her coach gave her a, a thumbs up, which was which was perceived by the referee as a cue. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's a ref discretion, you know, who knows. So um, coaches, uh, for those that don't know, in the game of tennis, professional tennis, coaches are not allowed to coach during match play. They cannot. And, yep. and um, when he gave that thumbs up, it was interpreted by the, the referee, correct, that, that uh, he was coaching by saying thumbs up either. And I, yeah, that was good. And move. I think a lot of time, I think that's put in there for the simple fact that who knows, you know, say they're – might have been a money transfer or something like that, then that's yeah. something like you might throw the match for and then they can take that away from that, you know? So it's like one of them things like let's not have coaches and those kind of things interfering in the match, let the match happen itself. But then Serena Williams also, you know, there was a call where she ended up snapping her tennis racket and, you know, that's unprofessional. So Snap it like right in half. Snap, yeah, right in half, slammed on the ground. So. And then after she got that 
got that talking to you, got that, uh, that uh, violation for the coach giving the thumbs up, uh, she went and started yelling at the referee, correct? Saying, yeah, she stated that he, he said that she was a cheater. And she, so she was saying that he's, she's cheating. And so she said that he said he was, she was cheating. Yes. And, and, and I, I saw just a little clip and I just saw her yelling at him saying, if it's because I'm a woman, isn't it? It's because I'm a woman. And I didn't know where that fit in that whole thing. But, but what, what do you think that was all about? I think, you know, you're in a moment where you're about to make another, you're about to win another U S open. Possibly you have a chance, you know, to, and you're like you said, the greatest ap- athlete woman in the world and don't want to get beat by, possibly by somebody even younger and right. definitely low ranked. And then you're in a position like that. And that cue happens, you know, there's already things happening where you've already lost a set. And then in your mind, you're like, I can't believe you're going to think I'm a cheater. Right. You know? Like it just, I think the heated moment. So you know, I, I know I know Serena's a competitor and she's a very fierce competitor and I appreciate that and I like that about her. And I love the fact that she's American. I love that she's she's on Team USA because there's no other tennis player, female tennis player I'd rather have on our side of the court than than the Williams sisters. Um <clears throat> But, you know, you can really tell a character, you know, you can't really tell someone's character when they're winning. You know, you really can't tell that. It's when the, the uh, athlete starts to lose and starts to kind of crash and burn where you can tell what kind of character they have. And when I saw her kind of melt down like that, I was just like, oh, come on, man. You're, just, just say, you know, she got me today. You know, he's <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to come back and we're going to we're going to play this again. But. But to, to melt down like that was, was really um, uh, unattractive of her. And I don't mean that in a looks way. I just mean like. And then the way well, to me, to be, to be the face of tennis right now and to come off and make it sound like it was a sexist thing. I think that. Yeah, that made no sense. Made, made no sense. But here's, a, here's, the, here's what actually she stated to the, um, I guess the referee, if you would call it that, or the umpire. She said, I don't cheat to win. I would rather lose. And I mean, that's what she stated to him. And I mean, it makes sense, but every there's, there can't, there's always a time when everybody has took the chance to possibly get the edge, which is, you know, a lot of people consider that cheating, you know, and who knows if, you know, the thumbs up was something, a cue for anything else could have been, we can't sit here and make, make what that was. And maybe that's something she'll have to explain later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just look at it at the most innocent form um, and not not look at it in a corrupt way. I mean, if you do like a nice backhand and you you hit the ball cross court uh, with Osaka, you know, to Osaka's backhand, which is a weakness, and she looks up at the coach and the coach like, that's exactly what I told you to do. Do that. That is confirmation of a, that's a coaching tip. It's like, yes. Yeah. And, and you can't do that. I mean, you just can't. And, and it does – like you're saying, doesn't mean that she intentionally cheated. I mean, there no, are people, no, no. you know, we're, we're, we're world-class athletes. Um, we're international competitors. And if you have more than like two cups of coffee in the morning uh, before, during, you know, the day of competition and you get and the team has to do a P test, uh, you could get disqualified for yep. PEDs. Uh, so for, it's called a perform, performance enhancing drug. And it's not like you, uh, intentionally deliberately went yeah. well, I'm going to I'm going to drink three coffee because I'm going to be really good it's just you were drinking coffee and you couldn't you just didn't keep track it's not yeah a, it's a simple cheat. it's an easy mistake you know yeah. it's and it's and like I said it's not something that I think should be th- thrown out proportion I don't I'm not saying that she took money or she's doing something corrupt or anything like that all I'm saying is the referees have, have put that there because I'm sure things have like that have happened possibly oh, in yeah. other sports or whatever and you know it, it was probably a simple cue that, you know, he called something, whether it's, you know, it was against her or not. It could have been, even could have been against the other girl. And the thing is you make, you making a scene out of it to take away the moment. Right. Yeah. Else. That, that's the horrible thing. And, and I think that um, uh, th- just the fact that, that she acted the way she did and she put a kind of, she, she gave uh a blemish on on tennis this weekend they she didn't have to do that and she did and that and that's just ridiculous and it's it, it's discouraging well it's, if you do something like that it's also you know coming what well, i'm guessing the french is it the french opens the the With wimbledon the french, french open i think the french open but they um they you know they already had a problem before that where she had wore the outfit the nike outfit. oh yeah yeah 
and then, yeah. then you know they kind of they kind of made that a big deal and then you know coming in with the limelight already on you and then doing this right well that that's one of the things man is that if the the tennis world much like you know um Robbie, we know this, the sitting volleyball world, uh, the, the tennis world, the refs, it's a very small world when it comes to the refs. There's only a few refs, relatively speaking, and you see those refs all the time, all the time. And if you, if you, you know, start some kind of controversy and try to make one of these refs look bad, uh, not only will that same ref put a target on your back but the other refs know now too because they're all, not, yeah, they all talk and, and it's just it's just the way it is you have to be professional you have to play right you gotta you gotta know that he or she is the referee and what she says go he's even if you disagree with it and what Brett means by a target doesn't mean that they're gonna they're literally gonna call every every call on you but they're watching you closer than anyone else like, right that's the thing they're gonna watch you and anytime you might do something co- even remotely small, they are going to call it because now you've created, you know, almost like a spot where it's a person against another person in a way, even right. though it's not supposed to be that way. Cause everybody has feelings, you know? Yeah. Everyone has feelings. <laughs> so Brett, <laughs> tell me, how do you feel about Nike's merge with Colin Kaepernick? This, you know, the, the partnership with Colin partnership. Kaepernick. All right. Well, okay. Well, can I say something real quick before you start? Okay. On that question, I want to say this. I do agree. The the commercial was amazing. The commercial was hands down one of the best commercials I've ever watched, and I think it drew it actually brought in that you know disabled athletes are just as able as anybody else, and you if we dream it, you can do it, and that is really big. I myself didn't don't support the person that they picked as the spokesperson for that but that's my opinion and i'll get into that more but i want to know about your opinion about the merger well trying to be as as um unbiased as possible um because i have my biases here i have my beliefs but i think number one it was just a bad business decision i don't think it was a good business decision um i I think what the what the uh nike corporate office was thinking is that and and historically Statistically, um, the African American um, uh, business, you know, uh, uh, African American retail uh, guys, they they buy shoes and clothes in a disproportionate um, uh, levels when compared to uh, white Americans. And I think that they made a conscious decision. Say, okay, we're not going to be, um, we're not going to these guys, these Kaepernick guys. We're not going to make them happy, but but they don't really buy our stuff anyways. They're not the ones standing in line to buy the, the next best thing. I mean, I buy all used shoes. That might make me dirty, but, but I just don't buy $300 shoes. So I think they made a decision that way. But, but what they, I don't think they thought about was their stock market plunging. Uh, they lost up to, what, $4 billion in the, the next two days after that. I mean, I have a, a very close friend. She she works uh, with stocks and bonds and everything. And she had like four or five cl- clients, tens of millions of dollars that they said, sell, sell my stock, sell my Nike stock. I mean, it's, to me, it was a bad decision. Uh, number two, I think that the commercial was uh, a great commercial, uh, but, but the fact that they put Kaepernick in there that was so controversial, it, it kind of ruined the whole commercial because no one's talking about how awesome these, and a lot of these guys and girls that are on the commercial, we know personally, and it sucks that they can't, <laughs> it, people aren't noticing them because they're too busy noticing Colin Kaepernick. And I think what really people are, are um, uh, really upset, the, the rational American, I think they're upset with the phrasing of what Colin Kaepernick said. And he was talking about himself in the picture uh, he said, and, and I'm not going to be verbatim because I don't have it in front of me. He said, um, be, uh, stand up for what you believe in, even if it means sacrificing everything. And if anyone thinks that Colin Kaepernick sacrificed anything, you have to get your head examined. I mean, he did not sacrifice anything at all. Uh, he might've sacrificed two or $3 million, but he's making it, uh, you know, hand over fist now because of Nike. I, there, there are so many other great examples of people that, that sacrificed everything. I mean, even, even if you want to take a step, just a step higher, Muhammad Ali was world uh, heavyweight champion of the world in his prime. 
and he stood up for what he believed in. He said, I'm not going to go to, um, <laughs> I'm not going to go to uh, the, uh, the Vietnam war. They stripped him of his belt. They banned him from boxing for years during his prime years. They banned him from boxing. He sacrificed so much more than a Colin Kaepernick. So it, it kind of confuses a lot of us uh, why they would use that phrasing for Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Um, I don't think it was a very big, a very smart business move. I'm not a big business person. So I'm sure they've looked at all that and decided, hey, whether we can make income or not based off of that. Because they really truthfully don't care about whites, blacks, anything. It's all about money Right. Um, in the end for them. I'm a big Nike supporter. I'm not going to lie. I've spent so much money. I mean, <laughs> I got to go to the Nike headquarters. I spent yeah. 10 $10,000 there buying Nike just to get, take them back to give them away to people in my community. Right. Um, it's, it's one of them things. It's not, it's not, I'm not so much against their merger because Nike's always done outlandish things like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, they kept when Tiger Woods had the controversy with the, um, his wife, they kept Tiger Woods while everybody else dropped him. Um, right. So it's not something new for, for Nike to do these kind of things. Um, I do agree with you. I think they could have chose a different face completely. And then I'm not even going to say it had to be a military person. Cause I, I yeah. think the face, the face could have been Martin Luther King could have been, yeah. you know, Rosa Parks could have been a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the division that they took Kaepernick because at, the, at this moment, that is what's here and that's what's in the media. And they tried to make face of it, which in my mind, I'm not against Kaepernick believing that there are social injustices happening because I agree with that completely. I am a hundred percent that, you know what, everything's not fair. I don't believe that a person that has been caught, you know, with a joint in their car should get 15 years while a person who got caught with a pound of cocaine, you know, gets seven and gets parole, you know, or gets on house arrest. I think that's right. crazy. Um, and, and I do see that limelight of that. My biggest thing with the cap, with the Kaepernick kneeling and protesting type thing is you never were for this before, you know, your career was kind of in the dumps right, and, right. on the, on the line. But all of a sudden when that was coming to the limelight, this was your, this was your way to get face again in, in the public eye and right. make sure that didn't ever end. And then to, then to merge with Nike who, Yes, it's been brought up numerous times before about the, you know, the China sweatshops and them paying, mm -hmm. you know, low, low wages for people to work crazy hours. But, you know, and you talk about social injustice, but yet that's where you want to go to show your face. Like, that doesn't make sense. Right. To me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also heard somewhere that uh, Kaepernick's wife is really radicalized. And, and he wasn't like this before. He just loved football. He loved playing it. He was a great, you know, he was a great quarterback. And then he married his wife and she was like, I don't know. She was like, uh, I don't know if she was nation of Islam or she's just a black power, just a real radicalized um, movement. Uh, and, and, and he, she kind of tainted his, his mind. And that's when he started doing all the stuff. Uh, I, I heard something like she, now this is just I don't know this for a fact, but I heard that that she told him not to take any contracts for the NFL because she could, he can make more money being a movement than than a football player. Which it almost makes sense when we look at it. You know, John Elway had, had come out and talked about contracts that he had offered. He actually offered two contracts, and the Baltimore Ravens actually had a tryout with Colin Kaepernick. But he's on average not you know, better than maybe some third string may, you know, right. right there with some second string quarterbacks, his, mm -hmm. his stats just once Colin Kaepernick, they knew how to stop his running. He'd become yeah. obsolete to the NFL because we need you to pass too. And we need right. you to actually, you know, score. And if you can't do those things, then you become obsolete. But instead of people understanding that and saying, Hey, well, I'm, I'm you know, I'm a great quarterback. I took you to a uh, super bowl and this and those kind of things when you became obsolete, they didn't need you any longer and for you to get upset about that. And then, you know, to sue the NFL and not take the contracts and then sue the NFL for injustice as well, because you feel that you were wrong, right. wrongfully, you know, that, you know, again, basically it was, they done wrongful against you because they didn't hire you is nonsense to me. I don't, I don't understand, you know, where it's gone from this one point to this point up here so fast. 
Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're, you're so right. And, and the fact that Z, what, what Colin Kaepernick wanted in his new contract with the Denver contract is he wanted first, first string money being a second string to, uh, style player. And, and Elway didn't give him as, offer him as much money as he was making at San Fran. And that's what happens. You know, you have to take pay cuts sometimes. But he said, instead of saying, you know what, I, I better take this because, you know, uh, I'll, I'll still be in the NFL. Maybe the first string guy will get hurt and I can move up and I can prove myself and then have a better contract later. Instead of doing that, he all of a sudden played the blame game. Like, oh, it's because, because uh, your guys are blackballing me, blacklisting me. And that wasn't the case at all. And I think, you know, when we look at it in social media, of course, us as soldiers, we, you know, we, we look at different people in different aspects. You know, I, I've looked at people as heroes because of what they've done. And I look at some other people and I say, well, that's not really a hero. That's, you know, yeah, they might have, they might have sacrificed, you know, this or that. We both sacrificed something, you know, mm -hmm. while we were in the military, but we don't consider ourselves heroes. We yeah. did our job and that kind of happened that way. But I never did nothing that literally cost me everything. Right. You know, right. Right. You know, I'm still here with my family. I still get my paycheck every day or every month. It's, it's one of the things right. that, so for like on Facebook right now, I have so much, I had so much backlash because I posted my own, my own post. Right. It's that it, it kind of, is kind of dis, disheartening to me because I lost friends, you know, and I've had arguments with people that, you know, I know that I literally know where you've come from. Mm -hmm. And for you to be like, well, this is what happened to me. And I'm like, you had a better life than I ever could have dreamed of. Right, right. Like, and I don't understand how you can be like, oh, well, this is how it was. And I can't believe I grew up like this. I'm like, you didn't, that ain't how it was though. Right. I know, I know you, you know, yeah. I grew up the same way from the same area. So it's like, and for me not to, you know, I don't know, me, myself, I know that, yes, there are people out here with white privilege. Yes, Donald Trump was given a million dollars to start his own business. That's, that's amazing. I'm happy his parents had that kind of stuff. And you, if right. you want to consider that white privilege, who knows what his family's had to sacrifice to have that money? Yeah, but is it white but privilege or is it? It's not white privilege. privilege. It's, it's rich yeah. privilege. <laughs> it's not really white privilege. But, but yes, white people had, you know, a lot of them have saved up money and done the right things and got life insurance policies instead of buying a TV that cost $8,000, you know, yeah, right. that, that, so that in the end, so our kids can have better. And then, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, every single person that like, there's not a lot of people that don't have that, but there's a lot, a lot of people that don't have that. That's right. Also, you know, I grew up in a trailer park. I didn't have tons of money. Like my parents, you know, they, we had garage sale clothes. I got my very first pair of Nikes from a garage sale. That's why I've always loved them because I wanted a pair so much as a kid, you know? Yeah. And then to watch, watch somebody be like, Oh, it's just because you have a white privilege. Like, <laughs> I didn't have white privilege. I'm not, I wore my Nikes till they could talk. And if you don't know what talk is, that's where the, the sole of your shoe is split in half. And literally you can bend it and it, water goes through it and everything else. <laughs> like my parents didn't just go out and buy me stuff like that. And it's sad that we live in a society where, where now we are put into a position where we're instantly, I guess, what, what would you say is we are instantly put a spotlight on that every single person has white privilege because we're white. Well, it's kind of a villainization of of a group of uh, people. You know, not even a class of people, just the, just the color of a person's skin, and and it really doesn't have anything to do with with what race you are either, what, where you, where you came from. It's just if you're a light skinned person, uh, you're you're looked at as a villain these days because anything good that you do, uh, it's because you have white privilege. Uh, anything bad that you do, it's because uh, it's in your DNA, you know, it's like, <laughs> what is going on here? You know, uh, I, I, I didn't, uh, you know, my, my parents, I was raised on food stamps at a time and, and it, it wasn't great for me, you know, uh, statistically, they're more uh, white Americans in poverty than black Americans. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of white trash out there. And I was one of them. You were one of them. Uh, we managed to pull ourselves out because we, we made the decisions like, like join the military and dig ourselves out of that hole. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, it's, it, and that's it the really thing. is disheartening. I think it's really sad because I grew up always wanting to be better. I think nowadays a lot of people, they kind of just want something given to them. So when I wanted to be better, I worked super ridiculously hard, trained hard to be something in the end. 
You know, it wasn't something that I was just born with a natural ability or anything like that. You know, I was really small. And at that time I was like, there's sports. I love it. And I hope to one day be great at it, but I wasn't given the opportunity to really draw into that because of my height. Then I got tall and I thought, why not? Yeah. You know? Right. One, one thing I'd like to say, um, there's actually a good friend of mine and, you know, actually a competitor that I've been, been on teams with. He, um, actually made a post his name's Sean hook. And I really, I really liked his post and it actually makes a lot of sense. He said, okay, I can't, I can't, stand this crap anymore. I am more conservative than anything, but I look up at both sides of the main coin and realizations of my thoughts. See, this interview of Obama and listening to the POTUS, now it's a wonder we are divided. Obama claims this economy and people argue. Trump claims it and people argue. Wake up America, we are Americans, not Democrats or Republicans. Until we get behind one another and stop this playground, he did, he did, she did crap, we will remain divided. The political crap has to stop and take America back. America need America will never be great until we join together and make it our great ourselves. We can't rely on the agendas of those politicians. We are out of touch with realities of us common folks. We struggle because Washington DC hasn't been united since early eighties. Time to stir the pot, time for some to give and take from both sides. Let us stop the divide, whether it's black, white, rich, poor, gay, straight, or faith, agnostic, wake up America. And it's yeah. true. That's, that's, hits, the, hits the head on the spot. If we don't join arms and actually, instead of, we can actually, we can still have debates. We can get along right. though. Like you don't have to make it one-sided and never be open-minded to why somebody's opinion might be that way. You know, my opinion for why cap shouldn't kneel Brett's opinion for why cap, you know, shouldn't kneel and why his agendas they are, those are our opinions, but it shouldn't divide us. Like he said, from each other, no matter what. Yeah. The, um, that's a great post. Uh, I'm glad he, he posted that the, um, the, the years ago, the whole there's a whole uh phrase that i might not disagree with what you say but but i'll i'll defend you to death for you to say it you know it's one of those things like we might disagree but i'm glad that you're that you're talking about it but now it just feels like you know if you disagree with someone if i disagree with somebody i'm all of a sudden a racist a bigot a homophobe um and and that's that's not how it is you know there's a lot of people i disagree with on the other side of the aisle that that i'm like hey i disagree with you but man i still love you man <laughs> but but i get blocked or i get uh, unfollowed or i get told that that i'm stupid and i think i know everything which i don't i know some <laughs> things <laughs> and most of the things i talk about uh, i only talk about because i know something about it i'll never talk about something i have no idea about and i and i don't disagree with cap nilling even during the national anthem if that's his choice yes people a lot of people say oh it's completely wrong I agree. You know, we fought for a country to, for people to have freedom of speech. And if that's how you want to do it, that's how you want to do it. My thing is, wait, I think you had, you had a platform to do it differently and you chose a platform that I disagree with. So I'm not ever mm -hmm. going to agree with that platform that you went in that route. So right. thanks a lot to everybody for, you know, listening to that part. And, you know, I want everybody to know that we do love you race, color, gender. It don't matter what it is. We all love you out there. So. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. So, so Brett Parks, do you have any strange news for the day? Strange news. I do have strange news and I'm really torn about it, but I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it <laughs> because it's pretty strange. But then when you think about it, you're like, uh, I don't know. All right. So here it is. Um, heartbroken parents harvest dead son sperm to create designer grandson in British's first. And it says, uh, what is IV? F treatment, a wealthy couple, I'm sorry, a wealthy couple harvested sperm from their dead son and used it to create a designer grandson and likely the first case of its kind in Britain. A couple were left devastated after their only child was killed in a motorcycle crash and seemingly ended their chance of becoming grandparents. But the pair who are in their 50s were reportedly desperate for an heir, decided to harvest the 26 year old sperm, which was frozen and exported to the united states bypassing strict laws in the uk their grandson is now three and is believed to be living with them in britain in case 
in a case that highlighted ethical and legal concerns. Now, on, you know, at first glance, I'm like, what? What kind of garbage is this, man? You're taking sperm from your dead son to make a designer baby? That, that, everything about that sounds wrong. And then I put the shoe on the other foot. I was like, all right, what if this was me and my son, uh, if I had an only son died and I wanted um, something from him, you know, and, and I, I, I think I'd kind of do the same thing. I'd want uh, my, my son's legacy to live on through my grandson. Right. I don't know. I'm, pre- I'm pretty, I'm pretty open-minded to that. That, like you said, when you first read it, when you, when you first read the, title it almost sounds kind of bad but then like you say when you read the story and actually read into it more it almost makes you it's almost kind of heartwarming that somebody would actually you know do that just so that they can have a grandson because that's what they wanted right it's it's kind of one of the things that's very sentimental that you know now i have a piece of my son that lives on right has a name to carry on the name too yeah it's it's kind of amazing i actually like it yeah, that's that's one of the, one of my struggles. But then I was like, okay, how's this going to affect the son psychologically when he's old enough? To, oh yeah, your dad was dead, and you're it, when when that happens. So I'm like, wait, what? And how? Where, where was the mother? Did a mom get inseminated? Was was it the grandma that got inseminated? I don't or, know what's going on. Or was on. it a random? You know, did yeah, they just do a surrogate? Random, yeah, a surrogate, like a surrogate mother that carried it. And- yeah, I'm just, I'm so, I just have so many questions. Yeah, I mean, you know how, you know how news clips are. They only give you certain, you know, parts of it. And that's. I know. And I only read certain parts of it too. <laughs> I, I, that, it's probably all in that article, but I stopped at, oh, no, IVF. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's my that's- story. That's some strange news. That's some very strange news. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this Sunday's Arm and Leg and Other Opinions We Like to Give podcast. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, please go on there. It's, it's under Arm and Leg Podcast. And go ahead and subscribe. You click that subscribe button. Also, click the, the bell, the ding thing, so you get subscriptions, so you get you know whenever you're about that. Yeah. If you can, go ahead and, you know, like our Facebook page and make sure that, you know, leave a few comments so that we can talk about, you know, even debate with you. You know, right and wrongs aren't always arguments. It's sometimes it is a mind reset that we get to know somebody else's point. That's right. Yeah, guys. Um, you know, like, like Robbie said, thank you guys for, for giving your input, discussing things with us, not blocking us, and we still love <laughs> you. And, and, you know, we're here just to, just to stir it up a little bit and just air some things out. Once again, thank thank you so much, and we are out.